I'm going to start by showing just a few slides, and we're going to spend most of our time today actually going through the new site. It's online at uh, www.climate.gov, but I thought I would take a few moments to give you uh, folks a, a bit more of the backstory in terms of uh, what's new and, and how we got to here and um, how you can engage if you'd like to either follow up with more questions or if you'd like to explore how you can see more of your content and data information featured in climate.gov. Um, so as you know, uh, our uh, website recently got a facelift. We began uh, a little over two years ago as a rapid prototyping effort, some of you may recall. And um, as, as a rapid prototyping effort, and when we started, initially we had no, no budget. We were uh, a team, a cross-agency team of volunteers who had fractions of their time donated. And we had to take some shortcuts and move fast in several ways. And one of the things we had to do to move fast, some of you may recall, is we stood up a viewer that much of which in this area here, if you can see my cursor, uh, was contained in Flash. It, it was a viewer where we uh, made available thumbnails and descriptive information. And um, unfortunately, that was a decision that we had to live with for, for some time until we were able to rebuild the host system. That's part of what's new in the new version of climate.gov, is we have a new host system that's uh, hosted at the National Climatic Data Center in Asheville. And we have a new content management system. And we've been able to move away from using the Flash-based container. Um, so we've not only changed the look and feel of the web page, it's on a different technology so that it's also viewable now by portable devices such as iPhone, iPad, and Android, and other devices that weren't compatible with Flash. And so um, we've made a number of different changes uh, in addition to that, and I wanted to take a, a few minutes to tell you a little bit more about that. But this is sort of the old, and, uh, and now the new is here. And so uh, with that, I wanted to talk a little bit more. Again, for some of you, this might be a little bit of a reminder. For others, this might be new. But essentially, the climate.gov portal and the teams of the portal um, are kind of focused primarily on different audiences and different objectives. So you can think of climate.gov in a way as being four portals in one. And the idea there is that in each case and behind each of the tab sections in climate.gov, there is a cross-agency virtual team and in many cases inclusive of people who are our partners or even in other agencies. Um, and the teams meet with some regularity, in some cases every other week or on an as-needed basis. And in each case, uh, each of the sections of the portal is targeting a, a particular audience and they're thinking about the needs and wants and expectations of that audience. And then the goal is to kind of start at the interface and work backwards into the agency. And of course, um, we have uh, climate science and research and services that cut across the agency uh, in OAR, in NESDIS, in the fishery service, in the ocean service, um, and so forth. And so the idea is to come together in these overlapping teams and to work together as a function of audience and objective to give that entree for our target audiences and to do it in a way that's commensurate with their needs and wants and expectations. So that's kind of a high level view of the rationale and of course, we're not imagining that it's just a build it and they will come approach. Um, we do believe firmly that increasingly the internet is one of the primary media today by which people, especially attentive uh, people, people who are heavy seekers and consumers of information in each of those uh, target audiences I mentioned earlier, uh, go increasingly online to find information they can use not only for their own edification, but that they can take and use in their jobs. Um, and so we rely uh, upon um, the website itself and, and our social media and ability for folks to syndicate or subscribe to what's there new in climate.gov. But we're not just stopping there. We have a number of opportunities for engagement and dialogue with our target publics in conferences, sometimes in controlled settings, such as uh, focus groups and dialogue sessions that we've had. We did a large-scale survey where we solicited feedback from each of those audiences. Um, and so we're always thinking about how we can make the site better. And then, of course, we're also working with partners and trusted sources and other communicators beyond ourselves to encourage them to think of ways that they might be able to take and use our content. So it's essentially a three-pronged approach. 
And you'll notice that these arrows are kind of going in all directions, so that we're hopefully whatever we learn from our engagements and our feedback, we are thinking about how to translate that into improved designs, improved functionality and scope in the climate.gov website. <clears throat> we have done, um, over the, about a year ago or so, we did a series of focus groups, uh, usability tests. We did a survey. We learned a lot about our site and about ourselves and about our audiences and through that process. And we're about to begin the second round of that. But I thought I'd take a moment just to briefly review some of what our lessons learned in that exercise were. Um, and these are kind of distilled into some high-level takeaway. Um, there's much more that we've learned. It's much more detailed. But in short, um, as a result of all these types of activities, we learned that our navigation structure is confusing to people, and so that there are things that we need to do to simplify and improve that, and we, we hope and we think we've done that. Our next round of testing will help us reveal if we have. We also learned, sort of going hand in hand with point number one, point number two, some of the terms and terminology that we used was confusing. Even though we thought we'd done our best to speak plain English, um, what we realized is that there was still confusion on the part of some of our audiences. For example, uh, people weren't sure what was the difference between the section labeled education and the section labeled understanding climate. Um, and so, you know, we needed to, we realized we needed to clarify and make it more obvious which section you, the visitor, should go to depending on what your objectives and your interests are. So we've, we've uh, simplified and used what we think are more plain English, more descriptive terms to enhance the navigation and to help people contextualize the different areas uh, of the site and what, what it has to offer. Um, people want actionable climate information and they're looking for and they're often motivated by what comes across their radar screens in the categories of what's timely and what's topical. Um, if they've just heard a news report or read a news headline that has to do with a given topic say a, a spate of tornadoes or a storm surge that has flooded a coastal town or things of that nature, then that often motivates them to go online seeking information. Um, sometimes that is uh, stimulated by what happens in the natural world. There's an event of some sort and uh, people hear about it. They want to learn more about it. Sometimes NOAA and its partners put out information that also triggers headlines or news events. We put out monthly and annual state of the climate reports. The Climate Prediction Center puts out seasonal outlooks and hurricane outlooks and things like that. And there again, that often will uh, trigger headlines in uh, news media and again can motivate people uh, to want to go online to learn more. And so we have taken several steps to try to put information into a sort of a timely and topical category and I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Um, People were expecting to find and were surprised not to find earlier when they found a piece of content, they wanted sort of different content types to be associated with that. In other words, they kind of come to the website with their own frames, with their own frames of perspective. And they expect to find content aggregated that way. And so not finding it aggregated um, was sometimes confusing to them or frustrating to them. And so we were trying to think of ways that we could um, accommodate all of these interests but help them to be able to find more types of content uh, that's, that's uh, brought together in those frames of interest that they have, which is, which is somewhat challenging to balance. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that, and I'll show you how that showed up on the new site. And then they want easier access to climate data. They want it formatted and interpreted for usability and extensibility. And we've done some things there. And we I have some additional plans in the works to evolve even beyond where we are today. And I'll share a bit more of that with you. Um, real simply, um, this is kind of a, a high-level map of the site's structural hierarchy. And so this kind of goes hand in hand with the simplify and improve. One of the things we did not have previously that we now have is kind of an overarching main page or a quote unquote front door. And so if you look down the Y axis or the left hand side of the page here, this is sort of descriptive of users' actions. So what are they doing? Uh, and this uh, in the next column is sort of summarizing what were some of the design drivers that we had in mind as we were thinking about this part of the site. And as you go down deeper from 
someone who's kind of just searching and browsing, perhaps a casual surfer, down to someone who's looking for content that they want to access and consume, and then even moving deeper, they want to interact and engage, uh, or they want to see an inventory. I want to see all that you have, things of a kind, and show me all that's available to me. And so as you go deeper, then these are sort of the drivers. And so we have the main overarching main page, and then we wanted to make it more obvious as you move into these sections that this is where you can access and consume and then even get into some of our interactive and engaging content. And then here, uh, there's both an ability to inventory or to see kind of the full set of content offerings that we have in the portal. And then this sort of burgundy line here also suggests going out beyond climate.gov. There are many very useful uh, and um, important assets, even beyond and not generated by climate.gov's team, uh, teams, but that do exist already online. And so part of the trick is to make available what our own virtual teams produce and publish but then to also allow users to discover what exists beyond climate.gov. And so with that, I'm going to, I'm going to skip out of uh, PowerPoint and go uh, into the, uh, the website itself. And so I hope you're able to see the main page. So here we are in the current uh, active version of climate.gov. And um, as I mentioned, um, we've done several things. So you may have noticed previously there was the Climate Watch magazine, there was data and services, there was education, there was understanding climate. And they've all been renamed. And then, of course, where you are right now is on the main homepage. And in this section here, we have a, a, a content carousel or a rotator. And so you can click on it to jump to a particular item of interest by clicking on the number. And um, one of the things we want to do is give you a little pause icon, but a thing I've discovered even as we're continuing to polish some of the, the rough edges. If I want to freeze on the sea level viewer and I want to read that and think about it for a little bit, I can just hover my pointer right there over the link and you'll notice it's not going to move, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and what I can, what we've decided to do uh, in, in sort of the interest of being timely and topical, from one week to the next, what we're going to be doing is having sort of the main overarching page be thematic. And so this week's theme is uh, climate and coastal inundation. And so you'll notice then that each of the content types are um, from the multiple sections of the portal, but they have to do uh, mostly with the uh, topic of coasts and coastal inundation and climate variability and change. And so there's the rotator, and then we have other recent topics, such as the assessment report, global sea level rise scenarios for the United States, tropical cyclones. And of course, CPC just rolled out its new seasonal outlook. And in each case, I can click the link and just jump right in to see what's new. So the main page, we wanted it to be clean and simple, and we wanted it to be representative of the whole portal, not just one section. And we, uh, one of the things that we heard earlier in some of our feedback in the original portal, if you recall the design, uh, the Climate Watch magazine was uh, most often the default view. And people were also expressing some confusion about, well, is Climate Watch part of the uh, climate portal or is it separate? And so in this case now, we've sort of got it all under the unified brand of NOAAClimate.gov, Science and Information for a Climate Smart Nation. And then this has been renamed News and Features. But a lot of the content still lives there. And I'm going to dive into News and Features in just a moment. But I'll also mention briefly the Global Climate Dashboard. It's been redesigned and reprogrammed in HTML5 so that it, too, is compatible with uh, portable devices. And um, uh, it, it works very similarly to how it used to, except it's been made to a landscape, landscape aspect ratio. And if there are topics of interest, such as sea level or sun's energy or uh, glaciers, you can select the parameter of interest, ocean heat, um, it's probable, so you can mouse over and get values for a given year. And it's got this interactive slider here, and I can change the goalposts, if you will, the x-axis of the years involved to sort of zoom in or zoom out over time. And if I want to learn a bit more about one of these parameters, such as sun's energy or what have you, I just click on Learn More, and it, it jumps me into a landing page where there's sort of a a plain English uh, overview article, 
and there's sort of some highlights. These are kind of the high-level takeaways. This is sort of a new feature in the new portal, sort of at a glance, what is this article telling me? Um, this is still an interactive multigraph. So you'll notice I can click on the axes and, uh, and sort of interact. And if I hold down my shift key, I can zoom in to see a given year of interest. And again, I can probe. And then down below, it's got links out to where I can go if I want to read more references and where these data came from, as well as links to related content, content that relates to this. And um, this kind of gets at sort of that interest that users had in finding other content and content types is aggregated under a topic of interest. So I'm jumping in now to news and features. So I can jump to any site, by the way, any section of the site from anywhere that I am in the site. So just by clicking on the tab itself, I've jumped into news and features, which was previously the Climate Watch magazine. And this is climate news, stories, images, and video. And in this section, we're targeting the science attentive public. We're trying to grow and cultivate a public that's attentive to climate and climate science uh, and the ways that the science is being leveraged to, in service to society. And so in each section, so on the main page, we also have an image rotator. But in this case, the rotator is featuring content that's only specific to this section that you're in. And you'll notice also that in the news and features section, we have departments. So we've done two things here. We have tagged our content according to the clean taxonomy. That's the Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network. So there's a taxonomy of terms that we have here, such as how the climate system works, natural climate patterns, climate impacts, observing and predicting, and so forth. And so if I scan the main page and I'm not seeing what I'm interested in, I could click on one of these terms, like how the climate system works, and then it would go out and look across news and features, and it would take me to a page that presents everything that's been tagged according to this term. Um, I can also parse the content according to these departments, and I'm going to do that in just a minute. I'm just orienting you to the front page. Um, here's sort of what is new in addition to the rotator, some of the newest content that's sort of timely. But then over here on the right-hand side, this is a list of looking back at our statistics and the votes that we've received and the user ratings of our content. Here over the last couple of years or so is what has been tagged as the most popular content. And then you can click on those links and jump right in to see what is the most popular. And then we have an RSS feed for folks who would like to subscribe. So Coming back to the main page, if I'm interested in an item, I just click on it, and it takes me right into the content item. Um, we've changed the layout a little bit in the presentation, again, to be uh, friendly with portable devices. So there's the uh, medium web-sized image. There's the summary, uh, interpretive information or explanatory text about the uh, global climate update, in this case, uh, work uh, from the National Climatic Data Center. If I want a large version of this map, I just click this link. People can still, high, uh, can still vote and rate the content. Obviously, since we just unveiled, we don't have many votes in this new system. We didn't migrate the votes from the old system to the new. Um, and then these are the topics and the categories by which it's tagged, and, and then the scientist who has reviewed the content, and again, what's related. And um, one of the things that we're doing also in uh, news and features is um, so if I click how the climate system works, um, now I've gone in and you can see that it's gone out and it's grabbed content all across the news and features section that's tagged as being relevant to how the climate system works. And then I can navigate by date. Okay, so I can go forward and backwards through time from month to month. Or I can jump straight in if I know or have a reason to suspect what I'm interested in is in November 2011. I can just click that. Or I can go back to the other categories. So multiple navigation vectors. But you have a breadcrumb here, which we didn't have previously throughout the site, which kind of helps you figure out always where am I and how can I get back to where I want to be. Um, coming back to news and features on the main page, um, some of you may be wondering, you know, how can I get my stories or some of my content types and news and features? And um, We've added additional departments. So we were always providing news, climate-related news that is published through our public affairs office. 
we were producing feature stories and articles. Uh, we were producing uh, featured images and video, and those are now showing up as departments. But we have added other categories, uh, some that are specifically focusing on decision makers, a climate Q&A, a section called climate and, where it might be climate and peanut butter, or climate and fish sticks, where there are specific intersections of climate and things that people care about uh, that are relevant to their lives. And in each case, um, you know, you can, can figure out and work with the editor of news and features to figure out where your section go, uh, where your piece of content, if you'd like to contribute, might best fit. Um, and if you'd like to participate in any one or more of these departments on an ongoing basis, you could uh, have a conversation with Rebecca Lindsay, who's the managing editor for the site and the editor and team leader for this section. Um, another thing that's new in, um, in the news and features is what we call an event tracker. And here we're sort of trying to give update uh, on different types of climate events. And so if I go into see all event tracker, um, there's these different places around the world where climate related events or phenomena have happened. If I'm interested, um, I can click to see the headline and then I can click to jump straight to the, uh, to the item that that pertains to, for example. Um, so um, that's just a high level overview of news and features. Uh, I'm going to press on and um, go into the maps and data section. In this section, we are uh, targeting people who are interested in finding and using uh, climate data, products, and services. Often these are scientists or, or special, specialized personnel. Um, and so we've done several things that are new in this section. Um, we are in the process of launching a new section called uh, an, an editorial workflow that's being led by Luann Dahlman, who introduced this call, called Climate Conditions. Um, in this case, we are partnering with scientists in NCDC, such as Deke Arndt, uh, in CPC, such as uh, the folks who, uh, who put together the seasonal outlooks, um, in ESRL, such as who put out the drought monitor, to make available maps and then to have them interpreted and then extensible. And so as we flesh out this climate conditions workflow, the goal is to work hand in hand with our scientists to provide these maps on a routinely ongoing basis with interpretation from the experts and then to publish them in extensible formats such as um, either KML for people who like to use Google Earth or GeoTIFF for people who like to work with, uh, with GIS tools and so forth, uh, or, or say a, a JPEG for people who just want a pretty picture that they can bring into a PowerPoint. Um, you can go in and you can do a search just like you always could. If I was interested in, say, snow cover, I could do a search. Um, there's a, a short list of kind of what's featured uh, maps and applications, and we have the, the GIS map application viewer, which launches a new window, and then again, the dashboard is featured here in the data section. So here, there's another submenu. It's similar, uh, but uh, different than what you saw in News and Features. So uh, our holdings are also parsed by global map, U.S. maps, regional, NOAA partners, the integrated map application, and data and services. So if I was interested in, say, US maps, I could click the, um, the navigation item there and see a summary of what's available here for the US. <clears throat> and then again, I can uh, navigate in <clears throat> to find uh, additional maps that are available. I'll call attention briefly to the partner section here. Um, some people know us organizationally and are interested in finding their way into a, a part of the agency or of our organization or our partnerships that are relevant to them. So in each case, uh, this section, we, we, we know we have to do, one of the next steps we have to do here is, is update it. We've added some additional partners. But if you're interested, for example, in the RESAs or state climatologists, um, this is a way to see these different offices and then again sort of go in and, and, and jump to their web page. Um, coming back briefly to the main maps and data section, we have the, um, the map viewer. It's an integrated map application viewer and you can uh, click on one of these different themes if you know what you're interested in. Just clicking on one at random. It, it brings up the map viewer um, and um, I can 
zoom in to a particular area. It takes a few minutes for the map to resolve to the resolution that I've zoomed in on. And uh, if I'm interested in a given location on the map, just picking a dot at random here, um, I can zoom into the Shenandoah Valley. I can uh, check the box if I'm interested in going and getting the data. If I want to see it in a preview graph, say I'm interested in temperature or precipitation or some of these different parameters, what's being measured at that station, I can go in and click the parameter and say graph it. I could have picked up to five. These are available as multi-graph. Sometimes it takes a few seconds. <clears throat> and I can go back. And uh, it's fetching the data each time I scroll backwards in time. And so you can see here that it's uh, daily measurements. And uh, again, since it's a multi-graph, I can hold down my shift key and zoom in and out through time. And then it goes and grabs the data to fill in. And so that's just a quick glimpse of what's available here. There's lots and lots of data layers available in the um, integrated map application. So I encourage folks who are GIS users to take a little time and get to know that part of the section. Um, I'm skipping ahead now to teaching climate, formerly known as education. And um, this is primarily for formal and informal educators who are looking for uh, resource materials that they can bring into their classroom or into a free choice learning venue. So again, there's a content carousel right up here. Um, and I can sort of preview what's there. Just like in News and Features, we have the clean taxonomy here. And again, what this allows me to do is parse the content um, as a function of how it's tagged. If I know if I'm an educator and I know that I'm going to be working on, say, a lesson that has to do with measuring and modeling climate, um, I can click measuring and modeling climate, and then it goes out and it grabs this uh, all of the content from across teaching climate and puts it here uh, in my window. And now it's said you have 218 results for the measuring and modeling climate. But you'll notice here in the right-hand side, so I can, I can go down now and start to preview them. I have a thumbnail, a link, some descriptive information. And if I'm interested in, say, a fossil thermometer or extreme ice or globe, I can just click the link and go now into that particular resource. But um, I, I can still filter further if I wish. Maybe I feel overwhelmed by that number of results and say, well, I'm interested specifically in high school. Um, and it's telling me there are 203 tag is relevant for high school. So, or I'm interested in middle school, so maybe I'll click on high school. And now it's, it's doing a parsing of measuring and modeling climate specifically for high school. And then I can go further and say, well, I'm interested in biological processes that depend on energy flow. So I'm going to click that. And now again, I've done, a, I've done three layers of filtering. So I've just filtered my result set down to 20 results. And this is what's available to me. And oh, this looks good, the ecology of climate change. And so I'll jump in there and read to learn more about that. So it's tagged by grade, by category, by climate literacy principles, and so forth. And it's a way to kind of winnow um, the resources. Um, I'm, this section is led primarily by Frank Niepold uh, in partnership with not only folks from across the agency, but folks from beyond the agency. Uh, and they've, I think, been taking a brilliant strategy by leveraging the Climate Literacy and Energy Awareness Network activity. It's an interagency activity um, to, to review, um, I think I like, like 13 or 14,000 resources that have been created over the last 10 or 12 years, or uh, perhaps a little more, by NSF, NASA, and NOAA grants. And um, this process has stood up um, review committees of scientists and educators to look at that number of resources and then to select out sort of the best of the best. For, and they're vetting for uh, scientific accuracy, pedagogical soundness, and usability. And if things that don't pass the bar, they send a communication to the creator of the resource, and they say, we've reviewed your resource, and we recommend you consider uh, making these enhancements or these tweaks. Those resources that do pass the bar are adopted into the clean collection. And currently, there are over 515, I think, resources now um, that are tagged. 
and it's all tagged according to the Climate Literacy Guide, which was published and adopted through the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And the principles of climate literacy are described here. So there are the uh, fundamental, uh, essential principles and fundamental concepts are described here. And all of the content in Teaching Climate is also tagged uh, as, as one or more of these principles that they're relevant to. So that's just a quick overview and introduction to the Teaching Climate section, um, where we've, uh, through partnership, succeeded in leveraging literally millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in uh, resources that have been produced over the years. Uh, the last section I'm going to describe uh, for you today is called Supporting Decisions. It was previously known as Understanding Climate. And um, the group here that we're targeting are policy leaders planners, uh, decision makers, business leaders, those types of uh, individuals who are seeking authoritative and peer-reviewed resources uh, to help them manage risks and opportunities uh, as it relates to climate. And um, in some ways similar, in some ways different from teaching climate, um, we have currently three categories and four content types. And so we have parsed our content in these ways, and I'm going to take a moment just to sort of navigate through them. But on the main page, we, too, have a content carousel where we're sort of featuring what's new. Um, and so these are often high-level reports or development of a new decision support tool, uh, things of that nature that uh, you can preview. Um, and um, here we have parsed by sector and environment. And so if I click this link, you'll notice I jump down to uh, the society and environment page. And then I can, I can filter by these sectors, such as agriculture or civil infrastructure, or people who are interested in air quality, uh, and so forth. And so if I'm interested in, say, uh, agriculture, I, I can click the uh, agriculture link. And now what it's doing is it's grabbing all those content, all those content types, reports and resources, decision support tools, and data products that are tagged as relevant to agriculture. Um, and so I can go in and parse the content. And then if I find something that's interesting to me, I can jump in, follow the link to go and review it. Um, but if this is perhaps an overwhelming number, and maybe I'm interested in agriculture and, say, economy, I can cross-filter those two terms and reduce my result set to find uh, information that's uh, relevant to both agriculture and economy. So it's a similar approach. I can also parse by, going back to the main page, I can parse by topics. So we, too, have adopted this same taxonomy, causes of climate change, climate impacts, climate system, measuring and modeling climate. And so if I click on this term, I get a result set. And I can go in and, again, begin to browse what's available for me in these different categories. Um, I can go into the regions section. And we parse by the Earth, by the continents. Um, probably need a little bit of work here. I want to change this to say United States instead of U.S. states. And then you could parse by U.S. regions, U.S. Ind individual states and territories. And so again, we've tagged content as being relevant to a particular state. So for example, if um, I'm interested in say Alabama, I click on Alabama. And uh, there are things here that are relevant to the state of Alabama that you might be interested in if that's where you're from. Coming back to the main page of supporting decisions, these are our four content types. Again, we have reports and resources, supporting decision, or decision support tools, uh, data products, and then professional development opportunities. Uh, so we have a calendar. And this, is, if you follow this navigation pathway, it gives you a way to kind of filter and parse. But if you want to see all that we have, you can just click View All. So I want to see all of the data products that you have in your collection. Um, so again, there's kind of a, a rotator of some of what's new or timely or topical in that section. Uh, but then you can go in and sort of browse down through the whole collection and see all the data products that we have tagged and uh, discoverable through the supporting decisions section. And then I know a lot of folks on this call have uh, engagements 
professional development workshops, that sort of thing. So uh, if you're interested, for example, there's a, uh, a workshop in June, Delivering a Strategic Advantage for U.S. Businesses, being hosted at the National Climatic Data Center in conjunction with KICS. And, um, and so you can go in and read and learn more about that if you'd like to attend it. And then we have a link that jumps you out to the website where you can apply, or register to attend, and so forth. And so if you have an event forthcoming for decision makers or planners that you would like to see featured here, let us know. We'd love to add it. And then again, like all, you can click View All, and this takes you into a calendar interface, and then you can see all of the things that we currently have in the calendar. Uh, not much right now, and I'm sure we'll be adding more, but um, at any rate, that's how it works. And then over here, there's just additional information. You can learn about the climate.gov portal, uh, if you, who to contact if you want to learn more, uh, or if you want to send us an email, FAQ, site map, and what's new, kind of telling you a little bit more about what happened to Climate Watch magazine, and then let us know what you think. And it's just a little bit of an overview. So that's just a quick high-level overview. I overshot my time goal by a little bit, but uh, I'd like to open it up now to see if anyone has any questions or comments. And I apologize for going so fast. It's true. At this time, we would accept questions typed into the questions pane of your GoToWebinar control panel. I will also mention that as you leave today, um, there'll be a very brief webinar exit survey that you can give us some of your feedback. And also, you'll receive an email later on in the day um, to which you can reply and give any feedback or input you'd like. Not seeing any questions, so here's a quick comment. This was fantastic. Um, great site. So Thank you. Another person that really likes the organization. Thank you very much. I'm thinking at this A time. A little glimpse of some of what's. Go ahead, David. Go ahead, David. Yeah, I was just going to say a little bit more. I, I didn't leave much time, but some of what's new and what we're planning for this year, and Luann will be leading this effort in the climate condition section. And of course, this is, again, is a cross-agency team of folks contributing and working with folks like Deke's shop at NCDC and folks in CPC, we want to have uh, a map kind of showing you what conditions are, and then with some plain English questions. And then other related parameters, like in addition to what's the departure from average temperature, again, trying to use plain English descriptors, how warm were the afternoon highs, how cool were the overnight lows, how does this compare to the historical record? And then working with, for example, Deke and his team to provide some interpretation with some other download options for different types of users. So we're going to be fleshing that part of the interface out through the course of the year. Also working with Mark Phillips to build a new climate explorer where you might pick a location and then you might be able to go in and see multi-graph uh, tools that allow you to look at things like rainfall accumulation, what is normal versus how much did we actually get a given month, uh, temperature superimposed on climate normal, uh, say severity index, NDVI, but uh, you know, kind of almost like a dashboard approach, but sort of data driven in a in a uh, in a map based browser. So this is the Climate Explorer, and uh, these are screenshots from an already working prototype. And so that's another thing we expect to be rolling out a little later in the year. But we're pretty excited about that. Thought I'd take a, steal a few more minutes and share some of that with you. Thank you so much.